this Penn Woods recording for the uh, Living Legends of Oklahoma. Uh, I'm interviewing Colonel Carl D. McGee of Pawnee, Oklahoma, who is uh, uh, an old-time National Guardsman who retired in 1962. Uh, Colonel McGee, I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about uh, the period when you joined the National Guard. You might tell us uh, what it was like to when to first move into the Oklahoma National Guard in 1924. In 1924, the 45th Division had recently been organized as a division. The all units were at comparably very low strength. Approximately all equipment, individual equipment that a man had or was issued to him was one wool shirt, one wool trousers, a pair of shoes and some kind of headgear, uh, an old campaign hat. As far as equipment to train with, we mostly maybe had some units at least, might have had, did have, um, maybe one machine, old time, old style machine gun, and we armed with the 193 Springfield rifle and of course the artillery had the artillery of the time in limited numbers and it was horse drawn. Cut it open. Cut it. I can't say. As I recall a private enlisted and he received 70 cents for each armory drill and each day of training that he was in camp. Armory might be the second, store, uh, second story of an old store building in town, or it might any place where it was big enough for to get what little equipment we had in and then set up some kind of an office of consisting of one box or something for a desk for the company commander. There was no paid uh, administrators or clerks or anything else. The company commander at a later date got the high pay of five dollars per month for doing the administrative work and later that was raised to ten if I recall correctly. A drill uh, Close order drill, of course, was in all units of every kind and description, but that was done out in the yard or on the street or up a road or any, out in the pasture or any place uh, handy to the armory. The, uh, we had summer camp always at Fort Sill with the hot breeze coming over Signal Mountain on at least one march to Medicine Creek, partially on the double. We stayed in Paramble tents, accommodating eight people and sometimes more. We officers, of course, had a small wall tent with two uh, two officers in the thing. They, li they lived really plush in those days, as far as according to all standards. We, most of the movement to the camp was by train. Uh, at headquarters of the military department of Oklahoma City, we had a few World War I four-wheel hard, tired Liberty trucks, and in addition to that, we had two World War I Ford Touring cars and one old Dodge. If 
we were fortunate enough to get to drive one of them from Fort Sh uh, from Oklahoma City to Fort Shell, which at that time was a two-day trip. We always tried to make Chickasha the first night and by midnight at least, and then start early in the morning and go on down there. And uh, stragglers and broke down trucks, we some of whom we'd try to tow them and get in by midnight on the second day with the advanced detachments. That was usually arrival on Saturday night. On Sunday, the first day of camp, they would start arriving by train. And our Oklahoma weather seemed to hold good. We could, it was even money bet that the move into camp or out of camp would be in the rain. And I can remember no occasion from 24 to 1937 when that didn't happen. At uh, the middle week end at camp was on Sunday was always family day. That was the day of the go what we now call the governor's parade, and the wives and sweethearts and children would come from all over the state uh, to attend that. We, each unit fed them out of their own mess. Dinner Sunday was a big day. We, of course, was operating on what they call the monetary allowance. We had from 34 to 38 cents during that period each day to feed each soldier. Uh, we'd save up some of this one, usually a fried chicken dinner. And it was not unusual for a mess hall to feed four times as many people on this Vister Sunday as they had authorized and drawing cash for on the mess. Likewise, it was not unusual in those days, as far as our mess was concerned, for a unit to hire a cook and pay him extra money to come to camp with us and be our cook. So we chip in, all the people would, and pay him that money. Of course, there were some of the smart uh, units that uh, had another method of paying. On the last night of camp, men getting together, some of whom would uh, prefer to see the dice roll of the cards turn. And by having this cook or somebody in the kitchen uh, operate the game and take a take off of each pot and put that in a can that the money was used to pay the cooks and the KPs. But Sunday was a big day. All of us looked forward to it and we felt that camp was worthwhile just for that one day. Of course there's just as much crabbing then as there is now, but possibly a little different type not quite so rebellious as we have in the present day. We, uh, and at that time, camp was a vacation for a lot of people. In one unit that I was in in the early days, there were, besides myself, we had the county treasurer, one attorney, one uh, veterinarian, a store owner, and uh, operator at one of the depots. We went camp, a lot of people, for the fellowship that we got down there. A lot of us wasn't ambitious. Many sergeants in those days turned down commissions because they'd prefer to stay with the men that they came down there with and didn't want to be a leather leg, period. During the time that uh, Bill Murray was governor of the state of Oklahoma and, of course, our commander-in-chief, he used the guard on several occasions to enforce the law. 
probably one of the most notable was when he called out the guard to prevent the production of oil in the Oklahoma City field by the oil companies in violation, uh, in a, according to his opinion, of the conservation laws. And, uh, of course, that was in all the papers and quite a political incident, but Bill Murray won the final round. Another time that he declared martial law was at the jail in K County, Oklahoma, when he is a friend when his friend, Zach Miller, had been in prison for contempt of court in some civil case involving his property. Uh, he, he, by that move, freed his friend from jail. Another ent interesting thing during his period was the war between Texas and Oklahoma bridges. There was a toll bridge across the Red River in southern Oklahoma, southeastern Oklahoma, and uh, a new bridge had been built and was completed, which was a free bridge. Bill Murray wanted that free bridge used. Apparently the governor of Texas did not. And uh, the first move, uh, if I recall, is that the governor of Texas sent a ranger or somebody up to this bridge to prevent anybody from Texas getting on it. Bill Murray counted by, countered by sending, uh, declaring martial law on this uh, bridge, the south bank of the Red River being the Oklahoma line, and prevented anybody from Texas coming across the free bridge. In addition to that, he plowed up the road to the free bridge on the Oklahoma side. Uh, Fortunately, without bloodshed, the battle was uh, concluded and the free bridge was open and everybody used it, period. Okay. In 1938, the Oklahoma National Guard, for the first time, went a place other than Fort Sill for the summer camp. We went to Camp Bullis, Texas, near San Antonio, and the units of the 45th Division from Arizona and Colorado likewise. And the entire division at that time was together, and if I remember correctly, we were approximately 6,800 strong. And at that time, we maneuvered and trained in the hills and around uh, Bullis together and the biggest problem of all was fighting the ticks, bugs, and rattlesnakes. Some of the members of the National Guard uh, referred to it as the battle of rattlesnake, ticks, and bugs. And that if I was uh, longer than any camp we would ever we had ever had. Again in 1940, the division went to Louisiana with maneuvers, and the whole division was together. That was camp near Pipkin. Louisiana might be described as where everybody learned to swim. It can, the rain was continuously. Any place in the area, if you dug down two inches, you run into water. That was referred to as the Battle of the Hogs. Wild hogs just loved our pits where we dumped our garbage. You could fill one up, cover it up completely, 
have the inspector look at it and he'd prove it. An hour later, another inspector would come by and report you for not uh, uh, filling up your pits in accordance with the directives from headquarters. Anyway, everybody had a good time as long as you drank. Another factor of that camp, we were guinea pigs for medicine for uh, malaria. One third of the division took nothing. One third of the division took quinine, and one third of the division took atabrine, and many were sick therefrom. Not only that, those who were sick, we didn't have too much problem cleaning up their mess. The hogs would come by and clean that up, and if they got too much of it, they died. <laughs> we had uh, hardly returned home from the Louisiana Maneuver of 40 until word was received that the 45th Division was going to be another first. We were called to active duty and reported on September the 16th, 1940 at Fort Shell, Oklahoma much to the disgust of many people. I think we can characterize Fort Sill, Oklahoma, as mud, living in an inadequate tents, and the battle of supply. Just proceeding, after our notice of active duty, at which time the division had a strength of approximately 8,000 people, we were authorized to recruit, recruit any vacancy we might have for one-year men. And our uh, recruiting slogan must be, join now, spend your year with the buddies and you won't get drafted on, on, on the fir at the first of the year and sent someplace else. Our campaign for recruit was successful, and we arrived at Fort Sill with some 13,500 people, which was good. However, individual supplies and individual equipment to supplement what little the National Guard had was not available. It was not even in existence. So there we dug out the old Army Reserve stock, which consisted of World War II uniforms and equipment, and you could pick up a pair of trousers and pull it lightly apart, and it would come all the way apart. And we wore some of that keep warm because that was a cold, chilly fall, and people were cold. The camp was not ready. They were building a camp, but it was not completed. We occupied the National Guard area, which had been built for about uh, 4,500 people, and the rest of the people were in parambol tents. and. It was not, when we first went down, it was not unusual to find as many as 12 or 14 people in a tent. We were finally able to get more and get it down to, to eight. Blankets, <coughs> many <coughs> had only one, nothing to no cot or anything to sleep on. We did finally get down to the point where we had three blankets for that matter for each man and uh, that was really a great relief and later the buildings, the barracks were built and we were able to move out of the mud and get into a temporary type World War II building. Some of the side lights or incidents down there in this battle of
was that the division was receiving through military channels many complaints from parents of the uh, b young boys that was down there about them sleeping in tents and didn't have a blanket and from their co from congressmen through that channel which according to military custom required investigation and answer but fortunately most of the more serious ones uh, were reaching us after that specific situation had been remedied. I recall one mother, a uh, banker's wife, writing about her dear little Johnny sleeping in a tent with ten men and didn't have any blanket. And when we got it, that was true at the time she wrote this letter, uh, but little Johnny he should have had two blankets if had been issued, but he wasn't able to keep some of his buddies from stealing them. So at the time, we were able to answer that uh, Johnny had now, he was sleeping in a tent with seven men and had three blankets, which satisfied the people up the line at least, and I hope his mother, period. In the first part of 1941, we received approximately 6,500 selectees. They came to us direct from civilian life, which necessitated every unit organizing training battalions and giving them basic training and Later on, of course, their individual MOS and squad and company training. This whole thing, of course, placed a great burden on the division in the training of the people who were already there. And um, we had, every night, we had NCO schools and officers and an officer who was, could get off on Saturday or Sunday night was fortunate. And anybody who got off any other nights was uh, exceedingly lucky at that time. In April or May of 1941, we moved to Camp Barkley, Texas, period. Another incomplete camp. We did not have as much mud as we had at Fort Sill, but the dust made up for it. And we continued that camp. At the time we moved down there, the camp was not fully staffed with its staff office. As a matter of fact, the post quartermaster at the time I arrived with the advanced detachment had one secretary and one retired sergeant on his staff and supplies had just started to arrive at that point, which again caused much inconvenience to the division from lack of supplies. Sometime after that, we received our first, what is now called Jeeps, or one quarter ton trucks. In those days, the Jeep or quarter ton truck was called a peep. The three-quarter ton staff car was called a jeep because its silhouette reminded uh, people of the jeep in the comics 
strip of the day. Continuous training and one thing about the 45th Division, when the training directive from above was 40 hours, the 45th trained 44 hours. Training of the division in all phases, and particularly in uh, company, battalion, and larger size units was continued as well as MOS or individual training in their specialties of the individuals. Training in the 45th Division when the Army required 40 hours was 44. When the Army required 44 in the Division it was 48. Uh, we had many maneuvers Italian size or larger within the division itself. And then later we had uh, core type maneuvers with other units of the Army, particularly the 2nd Infantry Division. It was after we had gone to Fort Sill that General Kruger came into our lives. First, he was the Corps commander, and then later he became the Army commander. And all, all the time we were in Texas, he was in that capacity. After Corps maneuvers, we proceeded to the Louisiana Maneuvers of 1941, where the Army against Army. One of the things of the 45th Division, on the movement to the maneuver area, we again staged the first for the U.S. Army. It was the first time that any infantry division had ever moved with its own organic transportation any distance. This was accomplished by what we call a shuttle movement. Take one half of the troops were moved one day and left at camp. The next day, the ones that are removed marched that whole day to another camp. The third day, the remainder of the division, with the trucks which had returned, came to the <coughs> by, uh, back to camp and moved the second half of the division to the first campsite which had been vacated by the first group. The next day was a rest. Nobody had to do anything, which was a lot. The next day, we made another shuttle movement to the vicinity of Marshall, Texas. And this same shuttle movement was again uh, performed. After all the division was in that area, then the next day they were moved to the maneuver area, uh, half of it, and the next day the remaining half and was closed in to the maneuver area south of Oxford, Louisiana. Period. The Louisiana maneuver was between the north and the south, uh, as they, we call them. That uh, General Kruger commanded one army, and uh, I believe it was General Lear commanding the other. Of course, we, in the maneuver, we used trucks and called them tanks occasionally, and uh, other substitutes for the weapon to fill in where we had. 
we walked towards the south to start with, and then we changed sides and fought back towards the north to near the area where we were first sought. Maneuver as a whole in the maneuver area during the campaign lasted approximately six weeks. One of the things that affected the 45th Division during that time, that Washington, after all of its thinking and planning, overlooked the fact that these one-year men were entitled to be discharged. So we sent these approximately 65 men and during the middle of the maneuvers back to Camp uh, Barclay for discharge. Of course, that number of men materially affected the efficiency of our operation. One of the interesting, amusing things that happened, we had a uh, truck with a 75 millimeter cannon mounted on it, imitating a tank. And he was sitting at a crossroad. Five tanks come around that corner. And the uh, umpires ruled that uh, we failed to shoot, shoot at them. So they finally called it a compromise and didn't charge that to anybody else, but they backed the trucks up down the road. The lieutenant in charge of this gun, he put a blank shell in his gun. The next time that tank come around the road, he blasted him. He waited till he got close enough that he could tell the effects of this blank on it, and he said to the umpire, oh God, I guess you say I didn't hit him then. <laughs> so needless to say, we won that little skirmish at that particular point. Another interesting thing to me, the Army had supplied the division with a platoon of uh, Bach service troops. Well, the Army forgot to take care of them, so it became our duty to move them along with our own service troops. And uh, at that time, why we camp them across the railroad track as we always tried to set up at the railroad so the supplies could arrive, all of which came by train. And one of these boys was a bugler. And uh, at Oxford there, across the track, was several stacks of ties. So we asked him to play Reveille of the morning. So he'd get up on the highest or tallest stack of ties and he'd let loose ask him to play reveille of the morning. So he'd get up on the highest or tallest stack of ties and he'd let loose with that bugle with full force and dance a jig, if you would watch him. And uh, division headquarters was some two miles from there. But I received a complaint from division headquarters about who in the devil is that of the buglings so early in the morning and waking them up. And uh, I had uh, felt necessary to dispense with his services on that by reason of the comments from division headquarters, period. Well, after the maneuver, of course, we moved back to Barclay and uh, continued our training. Immediately after December the 7th, we re division received orders to ship one complete regimental combat team reinforced to the Panama. 
158th Regiment from Arizona and the 158th a Battalion of the 158th Field Artillery, 105, a medical and signal augmentation to accompany them. And the requirement was that every man be fully qualified in his MOS. That caused a little trouble because when the command, uh, colonel of the 158th would call for 50 riflemen from the 179th or any of the other regiments for that matter, they would try to sneak in some of the yard birds. But he wouldn't have any, he discovered it, of course, and wouldn't have any of that. But when they left there before Christmas, that was a fully completed, was fully qualified individuals in every position, which, of course, left the division's strength very low. Uh, and uh, at that time, after the first year, we received orders for reorganization of the division. Up until that, this time, we had been a uh, square division with four infantry regiments, three artillery regiments plus a regiment quartermaster and a regiment of uh, medics and a regiment of engineers and a few other odd type units at that time. The triangular division materially reduced the authorized strength down to three regiments and three battalions of artillery and a battalion of engineers and a composite quartermaster company and a composite uh, medical unit. Uh, if I recall, the overall strength was less than, was near 11,000 men as the table of organization come out to us. That was accomplished at Camp Barclay. Then later we received orders to move to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. This movement, of course, was accomplished by rail. And if I recall correctly, it was the first time that an infantry division, a complete division, had, with all of its equipment, had ever been moved by rail in the U.S. Army as a unit. Of course, again, we learned how to load vehicles and tie them down on a rail cars. But we did arrive in Fort Devens in good shape. It was a nice camp. It had been used before, and it was complete. And... Uh, Every bat uh, had battalion areas. Every battalion had its own area complete with practically everything that was needed at the Army. It was at this point that we again received about 6,000 men, selectees, so here the training cycle started all over with its long hours of training and repetition of what some of the old timers had done twice before. But anyway, we accomplished that. And while we were at Devons, we had our first taste of amphibious training by regiments we went to the Cape Cod, and they'd load us on landing craft, and we had a chance to see what a landing craft, a 
and LCT and uh, LCP, landing craft uh, machine and landing craft personnel. We had a chance to operate and use them. We'd load in that, go out four or five mile, full pack for a landing. Run the boats up on the beach and unload and take our positions. At that, the entire division had that. The winter at Camp or no, Camp Devons was, I think, enjoyed partly more by everybody. Had a little time other than training to do something for ourselves. About the time we got well acquainted around there and was living in, some of us as far as 20 miles away, up we go, move again, 45th, and here we went to Camp Drum near Well, wait a minute, wait just a minute. Okay. Where I said Camp Drum, I meant Pine Camp, New York, uh, in the northwest corner of the state. Summer, when we arrived, or fall rather, in September, was beautiful. But then we had a winter. The winter was such that all outside training was finally called off and we had to have indoor training, and of course the officers had many paper problems, the CPXs as they was called. For one period of some six weeks during that winter, the thermometer never got lower than 26 degrees below zero, reaching a height of 48 reaching a low point of 48 below zero. But they did keep the roads open between the camp and nearby towns and cities where most of the officers and many of the enlisted men and their families lived. Housing was extremely short because of the fact that the division had just left that and gone to California and many of their dependents were still there. Of course, when we could, we had cold weather training at this camp, so we were making the complete cycle. In January 43, Again, the 45th Division was given a move to Camp Pickett, Virginia, for the purpose of amphibious training and mountain training. Again, by regimental combat teams, we had amphibious training and exercises on Chesapeake Bay with the Navy, actually loading on the large type ships and unloading when we, go, when we were to go on the beaches, it's same as we thought would be an amphibious operation against it. Regiment after amphibious training, we'd come back to base camp at Pickett for one week and then go to the mountains for two weeks mountain training. That cycle, having been completed, uh, a division thought we had a breathing spell and everybody could have a leave. But before the cycle was completed, we received the order from Washington that 
we were going to ship out to a destination unannounced and that we would combat load for an amphibious operation. Again, the 45th Division made a first. That was the first time that a division of the U.S. Army had ever been completely combat loaded for an amphibious operation. Very few knew where we were going. I would say the general and myself as the amphibious officer, or at that time called transport quartermaster, and two other officers of the division knew where we were going at that particular time. And other than the general, that knowledge was an accident caused by a slip of the admiral in, in charge in a conference in, a, in Norfolk. However, after we got to sea on the flagship, we broke out the maps and had CP exercises problems again, and of course the first maps were just blank. However, they did have the shape in place, and some of us who had seen the geography of southern Europe and the Mediterranean knew from that where we are going, but that forest was kept up three or four days and finally decided to break out the maps and actual facts on it, and we studied those. We zigzagged across the Atlantic, going far south, and uh, almost in sight of Bermuda, and um, finally went through into the Mediterranean, and we had to practice amphibious mining without motor vehicles and tow um, of any kind on the north coast of Africa near Port of Pooh. We stayed in the North Africa there for about a week or ten days when we loaded everybody up and took a few more supplies aboard and set sail. On the morning of July 10th, at approximately before daylight, as I recall, approximately 4 o'clock, we were in position to unload an amphibious operation on the co southern coast of Sicily in, uh, on three different beaches. One near Skogliti, another further to the right, and one to the left, close to Lakata, I believe it was. Of course, this was those of us on the knoll. It was a messed up landing. First, it was a little rough, the sea was, and the Navy messed up on their small boats. The Navy plan was that of each of the landing places, by each of the three regimental combat teams loaded on five ships. The Navy was to send all of the boats from all of those five ships to the ship to the ship with the battalion first battalion landing team. It worked beautifully on the first load. After that, the 
coxswains in the Navy boat went back to their mother ship and forgot to come back for the follow-up loads, which caused a lot of confusion. On top of that, the Admiral had difficulty getting these other ships to answer his signals to try to correct it. But anyway, we did make the landing, and were successful. Opposition was plentiful after we got in. And from there, we went on through the the north west generally now, it took all of our objectives and then we were pulled back and went to the north up towards Palermo on that road and we were pushing forward and moved and actually, a platoon of the 45th Division went into Palermo. And the, the lieutenant came wire, radioed back for instructions. They wanted to surrender to him. They were slow in coming. When they come to him, he was ordered to pull out and come back. The next day, A regular army division that Patton had commanded before come in and accepted the surrender of Palermo. That's the darn fact. That's a fact. <laughs> yeah. Well, now I'll go back in the next. Uh, the landing of supplies in Sicily, likewise, was fouled up because of the failure of proper pre-planning and the availability of men on the beaches to unload the boats and properly get it up on the beach. However, we did unload it, and it was there. One of the interesting incidents about rations, the third day, a report come back to the beach that the division was short of rations. I knew it couldn't be right, but they had reported it because there was plenty ashore and had been issued. However, on one of the ships that we had loaded that was setting in the harbor, we had loaded at Norfolk 10 days ration for the end uh, of uh, five and one ration for the entire division, which was new. That ship was in the harbor and was unloading. I noticed that, however, there was no activity. Went aboard the ship and asked the commander, and he first said he couldn't get any boats to unload him. I advised him that there was ducks available and they'd come by and they couldn't get unloaded. He said, well, uh, we don't have a boom operator. I said, well, we'll furnish you one. Oh, you can't do that, said we. I said, why don't you have one? Well, he's already worked eight hours today. And uh, I assured him that uh, we didn't have any union hours in that area at the present time. And... Uh, he was not cooperative. I assured him that we were going to have rations. If necessary, I'd take control of the ship. Oh, he said that would be high piracy. And besides, how are you going to do it? I said, well, I've got 33 men on this sh and officers on this ship. You've got 29, including yourself, of the entire crew. Is there any doubt that we'll take command of it? He saw the light. And we started getting them off of that rations, and then by the time we got rations off it, why, this report that we were short, of course, showed up. Wasn't well, anything to it anyway. But anyway, we had the rations, sure. 
supplied generally as far as uh, Sicily was concerned. We had adequate ammunition, uh, rations, gasoline, and, and all. One problem with gasoline was, was that it was on the south shore when we was on the north shore, and we had one road through the center of the island could use. In certain places, two-and-a-half-ton trucks had creeped past one another and made it uh, a slow road. But we were successful in getting that. And uh, I know one incident, it was amusing to me at least, was that I'd sent a platoon of trucks down there to get gasoline, and an army major tried to steal it off my lieutenant and order him someplace else. He was not successful, of course. Of course, after things were all over in Sicily, we again were ordered to make another amphibious landing near... Salerno, Italy. That movement was made by small ships, LSTs and LCMs, which made the loading and unloading much simpler than from the large ships. We loaded 180th Regiment from Palermo, and the rest of the division was loaded at Termini and Mers. We were loading three ships from Finger Pier and five ships from the beach itself at one time, and the time of uh, sailing time was 10.30 each night. This prevented presented a number of problems that we were successful in overcoming. All of them, and they arrived when at Salerno, when they, um, the operation at Salerno, of course, as many comments been made on it, and needless to say, we almost got kick, kicked in the nose, but again, we didn't. And after the operation in Sicily, we make a wide up to more or less the center. Supplies were adequate all the way through Italy. Of course, one thing that happened, the, we wanted, instead of a fly for our kitchens, we asked special allowance for a large wall tent. That had to go to Washington. The people in the Army having rejected it. And I recall sitting in my tent when I received the reply, which was no. But their meteorologist having reported it never snowed in Italy and that part of the country, and likewise that the temperature never got low enough to need and justify a tent. I, the endorsement back on that was to the effect that I realized that it never snowed. However, there were small white flakes that I could see falling from the sky at that particular time, and the temperature was so-and-so, which whatever it was, was well below the normal operation for this tent. I, that reply went around all military channels, channels directed to Pentagon, and uh, I assume it's still there because no one has ever heard from it. However, I was not perturbed by it because we already had the tents on that. As far as the transportation and supplies of all types uh, in the many phases of Italy, they were normal until we reached the mountains. Uh, 
that winter, and the we were pushing all the time, moving a little, and we had a battalions up in the mountains where you couldn't drive a jeep to, or, and some of them out far enough that you had to walk to them which did create a supply problem. Our answer to that was to organize a mule pack train. Of course, first we took it up with Army and worked with them, and they thought it was a good idea, and they would help it. A week later, we hadn't heard anything about it. General Middleton went to Army headquarters, and he found that they had a point, they was going to, going to appoint a committee to cure the mules for us, and there was a point of committee to write a table of organization as to what they thought before they could get any supplies to us. Well, they were assured that there was a table of organization in existence for many years, and if they didn't have one to come up the 45th, then we'd show it to them. Likewise, if we, if they would give us the authority we will, could buy the mules without any trouble. And uh, they were apparent with reluctance, told us to go ahead. And there was some Army Phillips pack saddle, which is facial in the Army, available. We drew them, but found that they were too large for the size mules in the Italian. So after some G2 and we found that the Italians had small pack saddles and we were successful in obtaining them. Likewise, we were successful in uh, obtaining the mules. Many of them we did not buy by reason of some know-how and some of the individuals involved would go back up in the hills and they'd find mules and didn't take them long to find out that all of the Italian army mules had a brand on them. And those were fair bait, so we didn't pay anybody for those mules. And we assembled them down south of, or near Venafro. Well, of course, the first, after you got mules, the first thing you need is somebody can talk to them. Just anybody can't talk to a mule and get any action. So we organized three platoons and requested each of the regimental combat team to furnish a certain number of men for them, and we were successful in finding a few people who understand mules. Of course, if you've got animals around, you've got to have a veterinary. Well, we had one. The name works that everybody in the division well knows. And he was detailed down there as veterinarian, and actually the operation thereafter with some assistance. He, we were able to get him a complete veterinary tool set. One of the amusing things about that was that about the third day he come down and wanted some parts, additional parts for it. One of uh, was a forship or something like that. He was asked, what'd you do with the one I had? Nobody stole it. I don't know where it is. So we finally got him another one, but uh, he was advised that if he wanted to find that, to go out there and dig up that dead mule that he'd operated on, that he'd left it inside him. Whether that was right or not, nobody was ever able to prove. But anyway, the mule troop train was used to great advantage with uh, by us in supplying our troops up in the mountains. In fact, it would probably have been impossible to keep them up there without the mule train. When we were called back to go to Anzio, Army insisted that we leave the mule train down there and leave our personnel with it. 
at some lay after we would been at Anzio for most of the time, they did release our personnel and sent them up to us. And the, at that time, matter of fact, mule train was no longer needed by the Army, and they were uh, disorganized and, and no longer in existence. Of course, the next place we went to was Anzio. All of the time that we were in Anzio, it was uh, never a dull moment because the enemy had the ability to put shells of large caliber into the unloading area. And of course, most of the unloading was done after night to ships from Naples would arrive after darkness, unload. They'd try to get out of there by daylight. But even at that, they would be entertained by the enemy with a few shells or more. That was a disadvantage to our supply and transportation, but we were able to amply supply Anzio, and about the only shortage that I can recall in the way of supplies up there was ammunition, and it was not due to the inability to get it there, it was due to the inability to get it from Army or any place to ship up there, supply Anzio. And about the only shortage that I can recall in the way of supplies up there was ammunition. And it was not due to the inability to get it there. It was due to the inability to get it from Army or any place to ship up there. And there was a few days there. It was uh, fortunate for us that the enemy did not make any big attacks because we were down to a very few, and artillery down to a very few rounds. I think Dr. Reitman, the G2, told me one time we were down to six rounds for each artillery piece. And, uh, but that was the time the jury decided his nose was bloody enough and didn't come back until we got more ammunition. Another thing, the enemy supplied us with 88s every day. They'd send them singing down the road where all the time, you st for a while there, it looked like they were shooting at, it, at individuals, but apparently they were not. But we had no major supply problems there. They did put shells and blow up or dumps occasionally on two or three occasions and that. Anzio and north of Rome. Again, the division was pulled out and back to Salerno we went for the purpose of training, regrouping, resupplying to get ready for the invasion of southern France. planning section is what they call the blockhouse. Oh, that's where all of the detailed planning for the operation is made in so far as the 45th Division Task Force was concerned. And uh, really the whole operation was uh, 6th Corps, which consisted of the 3rd Division, the 36th Division, and the 45th Division. We had all types of shipping for that. Large ships, uh, LSTs, LC, LSPs, and some of the larger, er, uh, small ships. 
we could load as many as five tanks on them. So out of there we went, of course, and the landing in southern France was, I think, been called the perfect landing. It was daylight. Air Force had done its job knocking out the points. And what they didn't knock out near shore, the Navy had come through in fine shape. So it was a relic, and there wasn't any opposition. The sea was smooth as glass that morning, and it should have been a fine operation from carrying out execution, which it was, some opposition. Supply in southern France was adequate. It prevented, caused difficulties in keeping enough gasoline, rations, and other miscellaneous supplies because of the rapidity of the movement of the 45th up to uh, through the southern France and up until we joined or made contact with the forces that had come in to Normandy. And I do recall that right across the first river north of there, where the bridge was out, we discovered that the information that the railroad rolling stock was in operative condition and that the highway or at the railroad was open up to near Grenoble. The division put in operation that railroad and we loaded it and uh, used it and the division accumulated a very large gasoline supply up there. Uh, the, the use of the rails and full use of her own motor transportation and her own labor, this was accomplished. Of course, about a few days after the railroad was in operation, Corps come down and said, that's not a division function, we'll take over. Well, they did. They took over with the major. They didn't relieve any of our personnel. And then about the next day, here come army down and said, no, that's an army function, and they took over with the major. And until we got things going there, we continued with the division personnel operating that, actually operating with the army in command, so to speak. One day, the division issued 36,000 gallons of gasoline to the 3rd and 36th Division, in addition to our own, by reason of our industry and willing to get it done. No particular supply or transportation problems, those that we couldn't take care of ourselves. Until we got in the Alsace Lorraine and the winter, snow uh, kept the roads and did have some difficulty from or the regiments and battalions to get to their men, the one that was on the front lines, but it was overcome and really did not hurt our operation in any way. We did the division necessary to go to a over 200 kilometers to get our gasoline because Army failed to put them up where it was supposed to. And 
But other than that, we didn't have no problems other than wool shirts and wool trousers, which were shortage throughout the Army. Shortly after we arrived in France, the division submitted a requisition for winter clothing to the Army, which supply chief disallowed or would not honor. That requisition was submitted then through command channels over the signature of the generals, and when General Patch saw it, he having been previously informed by General Eagles, he approved it and directed the Army Quartermaster to requisition the same thing for everybody in the Seventh Army. When those supplies came in, we were just starting to issue them. We were probably two thirds or three fourths supplied when the Battle of the Bulls broke, and Shafe find out found out we had them and ordered everything shipped north. However, we were fortunate in having practically 100% in the 45th Division before that order was executed uh, in regards to that. Uh, wool shirts and wool uh, were a big problem at that time for everybody. We operated somewhat different than most any other division over there. We had taken the bee bags up from all of the individuals. And the entryman had all what he carried only. He didn't have a bee bag back there someplace trying to drag around with an extra pair of shoes or whatever he wanted to carry them. We carried at division level roughly 3,000 units of individual equipment and clothing. So all a regiment had to do, or anybody that needed them had to do, was come down and tell us what they wanted, and we could supply them immediately. And, of course, that caused, uh, among other things, an investigation of our logistical operation, which came to naught. And, of course, after that, we got over into Germany. It was a question of fast movement with its normal problems of fast movement for transportation and supply of the troops, period.